So there are different ways of carving up the fields of philosophy, but the usual way of doing it is to divide them into, into three fields. So the, the main, the first one is metaphysics, which is the study of the fundamental nature of reality. So the question is, what's, what's real? What is really real? And then the second field of philosophy would be epistemology, which is the study of knowledge. So how do we know what's real? That would be the epistemological question. And the third field is ethics. So there the question is, well, given what we take reality to be and what we know about it, what should we do about it? So ethics is that fundamental question. Now, when we think about ethics, there's the idea that we can do something about it, about the world. It, there are three presuppositions, three things that are the underlying assumptions uh, of, of the whole idea that ethics, that there's a point to doing ethics. So first of all, there's the idea that uh, we are rational beings. There, we do have the ability to understand the world. We do have the ability to act. And the third thing is that our actions can make a difference. What kind of difference? What, what does it mean to make a difference? Well, you can divide the category of ethics into two into two subfields of its own. One thing is you can be doing the theory of what makes an outcome good, like why would we prefer one outcome rather than another. So that's, the, that's goodness as philosophers, academic philosophers use the term. And then the second topic would be the question of what makes an action right, what makes it the right thing to do. Now if you say what makes an action right, that again divides into two. That's what philosophy is about. It's about tracking these divisions. What makes an action right? There are two basic theories about what makes an action right. One would be the family of theories that we call consequentialist theory or consequentialism or sometimes utilitarianism. And that's the idea that the right action is the action that promotes the good. Sometimes we would say promotes the good as much as possible. But the key idea is that the right action is the action that's intending to promote the good. And then the second category of ethical theory, there's two main uh, views about ethics. The second view, the second category is deontology. Or sometimes it's, uh, it's called Kantianism. It's associated with the philosopher Immanuel Kant. So the idea there is that Promoting the good isn't the only way of responding to the good. We could also simply respect the good. And so when you see you have your good, I have my good, Sergei perhaps has, uh, has his good, uh, or any number of other people we could be talking to, uh, they each have their own good, and part of our, the right attitude toward the good as it is pursued by separate persons is simply to respect it. It's not to promote it, it's to respect it, to let people pursue their own good in their own way rather than try to take over the job of promoting the good. So that's the basic idea. Two families of views about the right orientation, the right action. Uh, one is the consequentialist theory and the other is the deontological theory. One family of theories is the consequentialist theory and the other family of theories is the deontological theory. So you might ask, of course, as everyone wants to know or decide or have a view about which of these is the right kind of theory. Uh, I would like to just give you the simple answer to that, but the fact is there's no such thing. Uh, as a simple answer. I do think there are answers, but there's no simple answer. One way to approach this, the way I approach this, is to think about, think about the wider human sciences, the human endeavor, uh, and the study of the human condition, uh, and think about the logic of economics. If you think about economics, the basic decision problem to an economist would say you want to maximize the good subject to a set of constraints. And economists will say there's no such thing as simply maximizing the good. 
every maximization problem is defined by a set of constraints, like you do the most good you can in one month, or you do the most good that you can with a thousand rubles. It's not, there are always a set of constraints that make it a well-defined problem. So if you ask how to be moral, what's the right thing to do, one way of translating that economic logic into philosophical terms is to say something like, there's a question about how to promote the good with respect to a set of constraints. And some of the constraints can be external constraints, constraints imposed by our circumstances, but other constraints can be self-chosen. That's the fundamental ethical connection to economics, which is that we aren't really rational. We can't make good decisions without self-imposed constraints. So let me explain that. If you said, uh, I am going to go to Las Vegas on a gambling trip, so what is my budget? Or I'm going to go out to dinner, or it could be I'm looking for an apartment. So I say, what is my budget? And I say, well, uh, if I put all my credit cards together and I cash in my pension plan, uh, then I can put together uh, this much money. And, but if anybody who did that would be mentally ill, I mean, normally healthy human decision-making operates by self-imposed constraints. So you say, well, if I'm, I'm looking for an apartment or a hotel, I'm not going to spend my whole life looking for the perfect hotel. I'm going to spend one day looking or one month working, not forever. Or if I'm going to Las Vegas on a gambling trip, I will say, uh, tonight I am going in with a thousand rubles and once that's gone, it's gone and, and I'm not going to spend any more. Whereas if I said, no, my borrowing power is, is my real constraint, it's the ex my external ability to get money, that would be a neurosis or a compulsion, that would be a gambling addiction. Whereas a healthy person imposes limits uh, on himself or herself. And that's really important because as soon as we get into the realm where we understand that to be rational is to operate under self-imposed limits, we're also in the realm of things that take on a moral dimension. So you start saying, I'm a political animal, I'm dealing with other human beings, I don't want them to hate me, I don't want to, I don't want to just fool them, uh, I want to have relationships with them that I'm proud of, and so all of those things become constraints that I impose on myself. Are we talking about moral constraints? Yes. Are we talking about rational, practical constraints? Yes, we are. If you want to borrow the logic of economics and import that into the study of morality, basically, you can look at two fundamental questions that are really ethical questions as well as questions of rationality. One is the question of personal aspiration. What's worth living for? What do I really want out of my life? Uh, and there's are, there are ways of being practical that involve, uh, I mean, you would say practical, not me really meaning it because that way of being practical involves wasting your life and failing to do the things that you that will really be important to you later on. So there's a morality of personal aspiration, or a morality of, like what do I want to promote? And then there's a morality of interpersonal constraint where you say, uh, I'm involved with other people, so in effect, if I run over them, uh, they won't cooperate with me anymore. They won't appreciate it. They will try to get revenge. So there are all kinds of things I need to do, not just as a moral being, but also as a rational being. I need to show respect to the people around me in order to give them a reason to respect me in return, or in, a, or in order to make it possible for them to afford to respect me in, in return. All of those things go along with being rational in a political world, in a world that, a social world, a world of other people. But those things go along with being uh, rational as well as being moral.